at the luncheon. We had them to lunch here before they went up, and I, one of the men there at the time said that sometimes uh, a woman is the best man for the job. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I recalled that to her and said, because she was manning that long arm, which was the furthest and farthest reach out into space to retrieve that satellite and what a first that, that really was. But now, I know you've been briefed on a number of things and anything that I'd try to say about what we've been doing would uh, probably be plowing plowed ground already. I was asked when I was downstairs and the press were there about they're continuing to speculate about the, the Jimmy Carter debate book, so-called, <laughs> and who gave us the copy. <clears throat> It was Amy. <laughs> and why not? She wrote it. <laughs> but we've been talking about a number of subjects here, and I know there are subjects that you all probably been talking about. And as I say, I won't try to repeat any of the things that we've been doing because I want to get to at least a few minutes of dialogue and then we're going to go in the other room and I'm going to get to say hello to each one of you individually. But um, there is one thing that I'd like to say that maybe hasn't been covered. And that is, I know you all want to say, what can you do, what can we do, how, do we, how can we help? I have never, I'm, I'm so frustrated, I have never known a time when there has been so much distortion of actually what we're doing or what we're trying to do, actually to the, de to the ignoring totally of fact and figure about some of these things, that what we need are more voices raised countering this. And we learned once in the picture business, in spite of all of our billboards and trailers and all of those things and the fan magazines, we found out in a survey once that the biggest seller of tickets in the movie business at that time was word of mouth. So we could use all your mouths. <laughs> I gave just one example up here. Ever since our Commission on Excellence in Education has come out with its report telling what most parents in the United States already knew, and that was that the quality of education had declined, uh, I have seen them up on the hill going on television. I've heard one of the candidates for president on one of the Sunday panel shows, uh, all of them belaboring us and the terrible slashes that we've made in the budget and that's what's wrong with education. Well, in the first place, since it started in 1960, federal support to education has never amounted to more than 8% of the total budget of education. $215 billion last year spent on education. That's a billion dollars more than was spent on national defense. But of that amount, only some $14.8 billion was federal aid to education. And that was the same as it had been in 1981 in the budget we inherited when we came here. And this year we're spending $15.3 billion. So I don't think the federal government has done anything with money that caused the educational problems. I'll tell you what it has done. For its 8% of the money over the last 20 years, it has insisted on about 50% of the interference with local school boards and administrators in running education. <laughs> and incidentally, there was an almost, an almost 200% increase in per capita spend, per pupil spending in education in those 20 years. And in that same period of time, there was a 14% decline in the number of students. So they must have had plenty of money left over uh, as the, the job got smaller, but the revenue got bigger. So um, now, that dialogue that I promised, yes. President, yesterday's action by the Supreme Court and the special legislative veto is very encouraging to all of us. 
Would you care to comment on how you think that uh, that will affect the Food and Drug Administration and how you intend to use the newfound authority, if you will? Well, the first thing, I'm going to use all the self-control I've got to not <laughs> gloat openly. <laughs> But really, it, it was a landmark decision. It was, uh, this has been another frustrating thing. Most of this, uh, much of it has gone on back over the years, but most of it has occurred in the last several years following uh, Watergate, Vietnam. And it has been legislative veto. And now to be freed from that. For example, just to give you one figure, uh, President Nixon, was one who in an effort to reduce government spending, his administration was successful in saving in a number of areas and agencies and departments and not spending all the money that was appropriated. And Congress just changed that and fixed it so that by law, whether you need to or not, you have to spend that money. And now we will be able to keep on doing what we've been doing in the economies in our various agencies and departments and have that money left over to apply on the deficit. And it's any number of things like that are just, it's a, when I was in Chicago yesterday to uh, speak to the AMA convention and Bill Smith called me there before the speech and uh, told me what had happened and I didn't have to use the steps to get on the podium, I just <laughs> flew up. <laughs> On zero to 100 scale, how far progress on? On, on bringing government spending under control. I, I don't know whether I could figure it that accurately as O to 100. But let me just say in one thing. The first thing is we've turned the entire debate around. The, up until we got here, as you can remember back over the decades, it was always debating, well, which programs and how many spending programs and how much more are we going to do in government? And for three years now, the debate has been how much are we going to cut? And how much can, can we cut and will they let us cut? If they had given us all we asked for in these first two budgets that we had to deal with, the deficit would be $40 billion less. But even so, we got about three-fourths of what we asked for. We have the increase in the rate of spending was 17% a year. We have cut that to less than, than half of what it was. So maybe I could say we're at 50. Not. But uh, with this added help that has just come to us now, we're going to progress further. I could tell you this also. Non-defense. Admittedly, we had to expand the Defense Department to make up for the way it had been trimmed back. But in non-defense part of government, we are way ahead of our target on employees. We had said, promised that we would re reduce by 75,000 federal employees. We've reduced by 65,000 so far. We said we'd do it in, in three years. So we're ahead of schedule on, on that. And we have a team whose work is not evident yet that has been working for two years now on the actual business practices and management of government, not the things of whether welfare should be cut or not cut or things of that kind, but on how do we do business. We were astonished at how far behind the business sector in this country government is. We're still literally doing things horse and wagon in government. And this task force has been working on these things. We have eliminated 2,200 publications that government was putting out regularly. Ladies, would you like to know that the only reason that you've got a clean kitchen is because the government had a booklet that they put out that told you the importance of keeping the sink clean? <laughs> and, so, and they told you why, that it would draw bugs if you didn't, <laughs> that it smelled if you didn't. You'd never figure that out by yourself. <laughs> yes? Dr. Ryder from San Francisco. I've known you since 66. My wife is here. But two quick comments. One on education. There was a nice article coming out of Northern California, the Vietnamese boys, there were six years, and came, couldn't speak English, or anything else, he graduated validate trying his class. I don't think the educational system is all that bad if somebody can do that in our system. 
And secondly, have you given much thought about possibly having a summit meeting with Andropov? Just, you know, to maybe cool off some of these people and say we're not doing enough to try and uh, we're, let me first comment on that, and, and I called several of those um, new Asian American citizens of ours that have come here in the last few years, called them personally because several of them were the leaders in their class uh, throughout the nation. But I have to tell you that the percentage of high school students who can't read their diplomas is distressingly high. But uh, with regard to when drop off, we're ready for a meeting, except in no way just to go and have a meeting to get acquainted and then have the letdown that would follow. When there is an agenda and something that we think offers an opportunity to make a real accomplishment in our relations, we'll have a, a summit meeting. We talked about that at this table here, too. <laughs> I will tell you, at the latest and last possible moment that such an answer can be given. <laughs> uh, I had recognized this gentleman. They've told me, oh, dear. Look, I'm gonna, look, I'll say it in advance warning. You, you, and you, and then Bob's told me that that was supposed to be the last one. And then we will. This is a comment more than a question, Mr. President, and that is that we certainly want you to veto anything that's going to be done to try and change your tax cut program, and you have our support. I'm sleeping these days with a pen under my pillow. <laughs> I can't wait. Now, you. Mr. President, I'm John Moran from Houston. Uh, I have only one suggestion to make that I made with Mr. Deaver. And I appreciate being here for the lunch. However, my wife is not here. She's got more money than I do. <laughs> <laughs> I would suggest that if it's all possible, that we try to have a meeting during the day which we're brief and have a reception in the evening where you can have many, many more people. And that way you have husbands and wives because the wives are a very important part of your support group. I think she would have liked it, and I know I would have. <laughs> I, listen. I, I think it's a great I, I think it's a great idea. Did you make a note, Mike? All right. Yes. Mr. President, my name is Betty Murphy. I'm not going to ask you for a decision, but when you weigh the factors, whether you will or will not run, I, just, I may not see you between now and the time that you vote. <laughs> Chances are, please believe that all the people that I campaigned with in '80 for you. Everyone knows that there are many qualified men and women in the Republican Party. But you are the only one who can win. So if you want to carry, if you want to have your policies carried out in the next four years, I'm sorry, you're going to have to do it yourself. <laughs> well, I've always said that the people tell you whether you should run or not, and um, I'll make a note of all that you've <laughs> said here. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I know I wasn't supposed to. Yes. There's so much disinformation around. We need your answer. When do we draw the line, Mr. President? Do we draw the line at El Salvador or at Nicaragua, where the Russian missiles are aimed towards the United States? Or do we draw the line when 10 million Mexican refugees are coming across the Rio Grande? And then they said, please ask, do we draw the line at Dallas? We draw the line in El Salvador. That, yeah. here, Bob, here I, here I have to take a minute. We talk some about this here at our table, and I have to take a minute for that. This is where uh, we can use your voices. Uh, we need this because of the constant drumbeat as we heard it in Vietnam, whether on the Hill or in the, the press that seems to be biased that way, that somehow we're on the wrong side and it's none of our business and uh, the guerrillas must be the good guys and so forth. We're having a battle with the Congress 
and I think their politics are being played with this whole thing up there. They would like to keep us just um, dribbling out little bits of help that are not enough to ensure victory. But if we keep on doing it, it will just take it longer for El Salvador to bleed to death. But the truth of the matter is, those aren't embattled farmers with muskets up there in the hills. These are professional, trained, uh, fighting men trained in Cuba, in the Soviet Union, even the PLO has been present and helping. We just met this morning with a group of congressmen who have come back from there, and they did not all go down there supportive of El Salvador. They have come back with some stories that I've said somehow we've got to get these stories to the public. First of all, they met young 16-year-old boys enlisting in the El Salvador Army, and they said, why? Why are you doing this? And they said, to fight for our country. They're not sympathetic to the guerrillas. They want what they've started. Admitted it isn't as much democracy as we'd like to see. It isn't as much as they'd like to see. But they've been several hundred years without democracy. They have to learn what human rights are all about. But more than that, these congressmen met with some of the high-ranking officers of the other side. And they were very outspoken. One of them said, we're for real. This revolution is not for one country. It's for all of Central America. Another one said to them, it won't be too long before you'll be seeing this at the Arizona-Mexican border. This is how for real they are. They are better armed than we have been able to arm the troops with down there. Are the battalions that we trained were the most successful? Because their army has been a kind of a barracks army where, you know, they went home at night and uh, went home for lunch and, and took the weekend off. And it's, it, uh, we trained them what it was like to, to be in a war. But we, we only trained one out of 10. And then we ran out of the money. And this is what we're asking Congress for. We need the American people to join us in saying to Congress, we want the war stopped there before it spreads. But their aim is is all over there. So far this year, in these few months, more Soviet ships have unloaded munitions in Nicaragua than came to Nicaragua in the total of all last year. In just these few months, that's how much they have stepped it up. They have virtually quadrupled their military shipments to Cuba, much of which we think is also uh, going across. But this is so vital to us, and I said here at the table, you know, Houston is only a two days drive by automobile from El Salvador. Uh, this isn't Vietnam. This isn't 10,000 miles away across an ocean. This is, these are our friends and neighbors. These are fellow Americans. Because from the South Pole to the North Pole, that's what this Western Hemisphere is. You can cross a border into someone else's country, but you're still among Americans. Because we're all Americans. And it's about time we learn to stick together and do what this hemisphere can do. And God bless you for bringing that question here and giving me a chance to. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going, I'm going in the name, those of you that I missed, I'm going in the next room and you're all coming in there and we'll each have our pictures taken and say hello and uh, then you can slip me the question. <laughs>